afternoon, everybody, and welcome to the Cape Cod Maritime Museum's 2023 Lecture Series. Uh, for those of you um, on the call today, I'm Elizabeth York. I'm the museum's executive director. We're so happy to have you all here today. Today's lecture is sponsored by the Mid-Cape Cultural Council, as well as the Mass Cultural Council. And we cannot forget our 2023 corporate sponsors, Cape Air, Highline Cruises, and Avangrid. A big thank you to them for their generous support of the museum. And it's important to, and worth noting that programs like this one today are made possible by the support from folks like yourselves watching here today. I urge you to consider donating to the museum or becoming a member. Your support helps us host these types of programs and many others just like them. So please consider donating today and keep these programs going. So a few um, Zoom tips and tricks before we get started. Um, I would like to remind everybody to keep your microphone on mute and your video off so that all of the attention can be on our speaker today. If you run into any technical issues, please do not hesitate uh, to send me a message via the chat function. Also, if you have a question for today's speaker, you can type that into the Q&A option. That is something that you can find on the bottom of your toolbar um, on the Zoom screen. So today's format is going to be a little bit different than we normally have it. Uh, we're not going to have a traditional lecture today. We're going to have much more of a freewheeling type of discussion and demonstration all about duck decoys. So today we have Paul Phillips with us. He is a duck decoy maker. Um, I'm going to let him discuss how he got into the field um, a little bit later today, but he currently teaches a very successful decoy making course at the Harwich Historical Society. Uh, on whose grounds the Brooks Academy Museum and the Kroll Barn Museum reside. Um, I will post the information on the screen today about how to sign up for that course if you're interested. Um, and another exciting thing to note, uh, if you're really impressed by today's lecture, which I feel like you will be, I'm 100% certain you will be, um, Harvard Historical Society has made a great series of YouTube videos featuring Paul um, all about decoy making. So if you wanted to learn even more in depth about it, please feel free to check them out and I will post a link to those and how to find those videos at the end of this lecture. So without further ado, I am going to switch my camera around so you guys are going to see a different view than you normally see. And I am going to introduce Paul. Paul, hi, say hi to everybody. Hello everyone. <laughs> so Paul, can you tell us a little bit, um, actually tell us a lot of bit um, about your method of decoy carving? My method of decoy carving, it's, I use white cedar and it's very, it's getting very hard to get um, and expensive. But I travel up to Maine and I have a good rapport with a couple of sawyers up there and I'm able to, to get the stock that I need. The reason why I use white cedar is because that's what Elmer Kroll used to use. That was his uh, favorite wood to use. It's light and it's uh, impervious to insects and uh, it has good buoyancy, and it gives to the chisel very nicely, mm. too. It's, it's easy to carve. Mm. Um, I use a, a various tools, and uh, over to my left here, I can show you. I'll come with you. So I have my camera on a pedestal, folks, so you will see me moving the camera around for some more detailed shots. I uh, yeah various tools here that I can show you. Um, I have quite a large amount of different sized chisels, but I put out the ones that maybe you'd want to start out with. Um, this one here is a number, a number eight, eight sixteenths, which is you know, a half inch gouge chisel. And you, and you use it with, with your hands so you don't uh, it's not up for a lathe or anything like that. It's a hand chisel. And then I go down a little bit to a small one. And uh, this is, I don't know, uh, it's less than a half inch. It's a, uh, don't have the number on it. This doesn't have a number. Anyway, it's a, uh, About, about five, five sixteenths, I'd say. And then down to a smaller chisel. This one is um, called a veiner for a deep um, single pass. You can make a deep rut right through 
an area, like if you want to outline around a, a wing or something like that on the side of the decoy, this is a good way to start. And then a smaller one of the same version. And even a smaller one. This one I picked up in France. Um, and here is a fishtail. This is a great one. I love using it. It's the number five fishtail. This is great for just... You can see a detail on that one. Very neat. Very shallow gouge. And um, I use it for... It, I almost like draw with it. To tell you the truth. Interesting. Yeah. Um, like if I want to accent a contour of a part of the, the duck body, I'll outline it with this mm -hmm. instead of going real deep. And, and of course, the carving knife. This is a carving knife, the exact same type of knife that Elmer used. I had to find one and I got one. It's a great knife. And it's made by Murphy Knives. Uh, yeah, it's a Murphy knife. I don't have the, it's a Massachusetts town off Cape, and they still make them. And they make a whole bunch of other types of knives too, including oyster knives. Hmm. And then uh, there's a certain, the certain things I have to use a, a gentleman's saw for. I call them Jim and Saw. <laughs> um, well, one of them is to cut off this side and that side, following this line here. That is the uh, what we call the primaries. Mm -hmm. See the primaries? These, mm -hmm. these are the wing, the, the large, longest feathers on the wing. Mm -hmm. And when they're folded up, they come to, they meet each other in the middle of the back of the duck. Mm. And I use this to cut right down and then this way also. Now, I uh, probably should tell you that these are blanks that I've made up for the next class coming up on March 31st. This one is going to be a, a uh, let's see. Golden eye. This is the golden eye. Um, the head is made carved separately. In fact, the, car the head is carved first before you start the body. Because you want that head all finished so that you know how to carve the body to, you know. Mm -hmm. To the head size? Excuse me? To the size of the head? Well, this has to be all shaped and carved. Mm -hmm. And it's going... The body, body has to be carved to admit this head to it. Right, okay. So you have to have this done first. Okay. And this one's a bottle head. Same with little primaries on the back. Mm -hmm. One of the cutest types of ducks, I think, in my humble opinion. Yes, and over here I have one, a finished one. Now, with decoys, you don't have to get heavy detail. Just simple markings will distinguish this from any other species from the air as the ducks flying over. Mm -hmm. Gray tail feathers, a nice white side, black top, mm -hmm. back. And you can see the primaries there too. Yes, the, the, yeah, the primaries on this one. Wonderful. Sometimes I don't use the primaries um, especially with, with the new students, because it's a lot of extra work and it's not needed. Most, most hunters do not want the primaries, the old timers, because when the decoy is tossed out into the water, um, the anchor line is wrapped around the decoy, coiled around the decoy mm -hmm. like this. Mm -hmm. And with that, those primaries sticking out like that, they could snag it up. Oh. And the anchor will never meet the bottom. Oh, okay. Because the bottom's on the other end of the line. There you go. And it'll just float away. <laughs> but, uh, so anyway, we're, let's, let's get on with this. Um, sure. And, okay, this one is another one that's going to be 
offer it up. It's a wimbrel. It's a shorter, semi-long legs, decurved bill, and uh, I've got uh, four or five of these to offer. And this doesn't have. Um, it doesn't have to have any extra work done to it for the bandsaw. It's just like cut it out of the bandsaw, the top profile and the side, and the side profile, which mm. I haven't explained yet. Mm. Okay, we should get back to that. Uh, here is a block that you start with. First of all, you have to decide on what kind of species you want to carve. And um, you need good reference. Mm -hmm. And um, I have my own measurement, my uh, own dimensions, decoid dimensions here. And for this one, it's mallard. And on the mallard, uh, the body length is 14 and a quarter. The width is five and three quarters inch. And the height is about five and a third high. So I have to keep that on consideration when I'm making my templates. This is some templates for a shore, uh, a shore bird here, oyster catcher, mm -hmm. which I'm, is an order I'm doing. And uh, after I have these drawn out to my liking, I cut these out roughly, you know, don't cut all any lines out, and I use um, glue, like Elmer's glue or something like that, mm -hmm. diluted. Mm -hmm. And uh, I slap it on the on the on the newsprint. I use newsprint. I don't know if anyone in there knows what newsprint is, but <laughs> it is very absorbent to water. And uh, it's kind of like the, the uh, thickness of some of the some of the pages in the newspaper, like mm -hmm. the advertisement and yeah. stuff. It's thicker, mm -hmm. a little bit thicker. And uh, you put it on a piece of thin slab wood. I, I cut it on an advanced to make thin slices of wood and let it sit overnight. And then the next day, I'll just very carefully uh, follow the lines mm. of my drawing that's been glued down to the wood. And I'll have a nice wooden template that will last a long time. Mm. Okay, so this block received the side profile. I drew it on and then cut it out on the bandsaw. It goes all the way through here. And then after I got that done, I put it back all back together again. And I put my top profile, drew it out and saw and put it back on the saw and then after I got both those templates cut out. Voila. There is a four-sided square decoy body. That's what they start out with. And this doesn't have the primaries, like I told you before. Mm. So that's what they get. Oh, I forgot one thing. You have to have an armature on these guys because they are placed in a vise. So that's that goes into the vise. That armature holds it in position, and you're able to carve using all the different tools that you want. And one of the most aggressive. And strongest tool to use is the draw knife. This is the draw knife. You hold it like this, and you start pulling away all that squareness. Get a get a, a you know a rough shape of the way, what you want it to look at look like. And then after you get it all shaped out pretty good, 
you have to uh, go ahead. And um, I suggest just to save time using a rasp. This is called a true form. You can get these at Home Depot, they sell them. And they really, really rip the wood off. And uh, also, the smoke shave is another, it's sort of like one of these guys, but a lot tamer. Uh, then for removing stuff like around the neck, this area here, all that area, use a mallet and a chisel. You knock off that wood. There's a lot of sanding going on after you have all your carving done. Smooth it all out and round it up nicely. And uh, this all takes time and patience. But, you know, eventually you'll see it. You'll see it coming to, to fruition. You can see, see the body that you're carving. And you end, up with, you end up with this guy right here with the head carved. Mm -hmm. And I, I made this one turn so it's preening <laughs> or getting ready to go to sleep. Either way, this is called a confidence decoy. A, a mallard flying overhead will see this decoy floating down below on the water, mm -hmm. and it'll come down to check it out. It looks safe to the, to the duck, so he can, just comes down and checks it out. Mm -hmm. um, and after I have all that uh, carving and sanding done, I painted, and that's the painted piece. Nail mallard. Very nice. Now, what else can we talk about? Do you want to talk about the types of woods that you use? Something, some, some really important features about mm. duck carving mm. is that you have to always keep a center line on your duck body mm -hmm. and your duck head. See how I had the dotted line? Always keep that center, center line uh, present. Mm. You lose it sometimes when you're sanding. Mm -hmm. Just draw it back in, make sure you know exactly where it was. Mm -hmm. And uh, also, after the silhouette of the duck head is cut out, you drill a little small hole right through while it's still flat and square and everything, very square, because that is the guide hole for the eyes, mm -hmm. so that they line up after you're when you're ready to set them in mm -hmm. place. We use glass eyes made in Germany. And there's different colors and different sizes you can get. And uh, there's like the golden eye is yellow and uh, the mallet is brown. And the merganser is red and so forth and so on. We have a question um, from the audience today. The question is from Phil. He says, Paul. Do you use any internal weighting to get the decoy to ride appropriately in the water? Yes. Um, these are this, these particular class decoys are solid body. Mm -hmm. Making them hollow is a lot of extra work, which I don't believe that a beginner should have to learn how to do. But the, in the old days, hunters really would rather the, the, the maker to hollow them out, less weight. They have two dozen decoys slung over their shoulders and they're walking across the marshes to get to the blind. And that cuts back on the weight. Mm -hmm. And it also makes them sit right high in the water. Now, as far as the weight goes, yes. Uh, you take, I take, I don't know where it is. 
A rubber band, a big old rubber band. And I wrap it around. This, 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 oh, we'll go with this one, the finish decoy. This is much big, too big a rubber band, but it hold, it'll hold a piece of lead. Mm -hmm. I use lead. Mm -hmm. I, did I, did I, mold, I, I melt in a mold. And I'll slide it back and forth until I find where the decoy is balanced in the water. Mm -hmm. And that's where I'll attach it. It's the only metal fastener that I'll use in the decoy. Mm -hmm. Everything else is dial and glue. Mm -hmm. Did that answer your question? Yes. And folks, I do also want to remind you, please feel free to ask questions in the Q&A or the chat as we go through. Um, we're very, very happy to keep answering your questions. Um, so please don't, don't be shy. Feel free to ask questions. Okay. So we have the head carved. We have, we have the body carved. We decide the positioning of the head is called the character of the decoy. Um, then we attach the, the newly carved head and sanded and shaped and everything to the body and using a dowel of a, you know, a good size dowel, you know, no, no, no skinny stuff. Put this on the drill press, nice, you know, perpendicular hole into the body and then into the head. You have to do the head usually by, by eye, mm -hmm. which is, takes a little practice to get it right. <laughs> uh, it's been a few times where I've had to start all over again uh, with the head. Um, and then glue. Type bond is the best glue to buy. Type bond? Type bond glue. Type bond, okay. Yeah, uh, the type bond ultimate. Ultimate. Yeah. Yeah, that's nice. It's very uh, water resilient. Mm. Resistance. Um, okay, so the, body's, the body and the head are now attached. And you can begin with the painting process. Now, with the painting process, you need some good illustrations of the particular species that you're carving. And uh, you have to use your intuition now. Because you're going to look at that that body, and you're going to see different color color areas mm. on the on the body of the of the duck and the head markings. But first, you have to have your base colors. So, with this this particular guy, this gray, and I drew in this area of of uh, feathering. And it's just plain gray, and then it was a brown on the top, a light brown. And then I had black back here, and the green, mm -hmm. and the yellow. But anyway, you get your basic colors, you know, the uh, colors that are underneath all your detail work. Mm. And then uh, you start doing your detail work. And everyone's different. I ask what I always tell my students, don't try to be like me. Do it your own way, your own interpretation. Ducks don't know the difference. They just see something that looks attractive down below and they're going to go, come down to check it out. So is it a little bit like Bob Ross? You can have happy little accidents? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Wonderful. <laughs> okay. Uh, so anyway, that's the, that's the whole thing. This is like the decoy. It's like a duck lure, like a fish lure. Mm -hmm. It attracts the duck. We have a question um, from Bob Frizee. I saw him earlier this morning. Hi, hi Bob again. Um, so he says, hi, Paul. Could you talk briefly about the sharpening or the proper sharpening of some of the tools that you use? Okay. Mm. I use the diamond plate Stone. It's not a stone. It's a bar of steel, mm -hmm. and it's got diamond dust impregnated in it. Mm -hmm. And uh, I didn't bring it with me, I don't think, unless it's in my tool bag. 
And I was using it earlier today and I left it on the bench. All right. That's okay. I can explain it to you mm -hmm. without it. You take, well, let's say this is the stone right here, this piece of wood. Mm -hmm. Let me get this area cleared off a little bit. I don't use oil or water or anything with a diamond encrusted steel plate. It's a, uh, does a nice job with all that, without the extra lubrication. Mm -hmm. I'll just put this aside. So. I like to hold it on the edge of the bench, the uh, stone, and uh, I just run it back and forth like this. Can you see? Can, can you see? Let me get closer. There we go. Like that, mm -hmm. back and forth following the curve of the gouge. And then I have a small uh, little, it's, it's like a grinder, uh, but it's a miniature one. And one side has a, 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 a cloth wheel on it, rag wheel. Hmm. I use, uh, I call rouge. It's, Palm space, I guess. I don't know what the, it holds it all together, but you run that on the on the rag wheel until it darkens the, the surface of the wheel up, and you put it with the curved side mm -hmm. down, and actually it'd be like this because it's going this way, and uh, that'll get the burr off of it, mm -hmm. and you feel it, and you don't want you don't want to touch that to you know, to uh, with too much vigor because you're going to get cut. Yeah. And that's, why, that's how I keep all my tools nice and sharp. They're safer than a dull tool. Mm -hmm. We've got a question um, about the type of wood. So if white cedar is hard to get, what is your second choice for material? Okay. Or third? That's a good one. Mm -hmm. I could, I could uh, white pine clear white pine, mm -hmm. which is pretty abundant still. Mm -hmm. And there's a lot of big stock up, up north in New Hampshire. And it, it doesn't give as well as cedar does, but it does, you can carve nice and uniformly, uniformly carve with it and get through the same results. Mm. White pine. White pine, all right. Um, another question uh, from Kevin. Hi, Kevin. Um, he says, Paul, do you use a finish coat after you have painted the colors? Aha. Uh -huh. Now, duck hunters will tell you, do not make that surface shiny. Mm. Keep it opaque. Uh, if you use like a matte finish okay. uh, varnish, something that's got, that dulls the gloss. Mm. You don't want it to shine because that, that'll uh, spook them. They won't come across. Right. It doesn't look lifelike enough. That's right. Interesting. Um, all right. Now, we have another question from Ellen. She asks a great question. Um, so perhaps this is a little bit of a good segue. She asks, what makes you, what made you fall in love with making decoys, and what is your favorite part of the process? So do you want to talk a little bit about how you got into this? Sure. All right. Um, I used to... Uh, before I started doing the uh, decors about 30 years ago, I was making wooden buoys, which was the old fashioned way of, of marking your mooring, you know, for your boats and different colors, you know, for the different owners mm -hmm. and uh, different shapes, always with a long dowel coming out the end of it so you could grab it bring it up. 
boat and stayed off. So anyway, I kept, I did that for a while at, at a flea market in Wallfleet every weekend. I was a vendor there. And uh, I brought them all up in my pickup truck, built a frame for my pickup truck, and was able to get some old weir net, and I just flung it across the frame up that was built on the back of my truck, and I hung all the decoys off the net. And it was just all, this, all these different colors, different shapes, and people loved it. And uh, the person here was selling pretty good. I was doing, making a living at it. And uh, one weekend I was loading the truck up, getting ready to go to the flea market with my boys. And I noticed that just a chunk of wood over in the corner of the garage. And I said, it reminded me of a duck body. I said, I'm going to make a duck body. I can make a goose. I made a long neck and a head. And I attached it all together. And uh, I didn't paint it. I just put some old yellow shellac over it to make it look kind of on the old side. Mm. Give it a couple of coats. And I stuck that down on the ground in front of the truck, on the side of the truck, below all the buoys. And it's the first thing that sold. And I said, okay, that's it. Let's mm. make decoys. <laughs> and uh, that started me on that. And I met a few, few um, decoy makers along the way that helped me along, coached me, and even some appraisers, antique decoy appraisers that really knew their business. And uh, through them, I, I was given uh, reference material to, to read, and mm -hmm. it just blossomed, you know, just kept getting bigger and bigger, mm -hmm. escalated to the point where. Um, Collectors by my work now. What's your favorite part of the process? The favorite part? I think I get pretty, pretty excited when I'm carving. <laughs> <laughs> I like to carve it. And, you know, the, the, the painting part I can do. I'm an um, art school student, uh, student. I went to the Boston Museum School of Fine Arts. I learned the basics. And uh, I can paint. And uh, it takes a lot of concentration. And it all feels free. I feel really like glued to that decoy. I can't stop until I can't go any further further with it. And I have to put it aside. Mm -hmm. let the paint dry and come back to it again <laughs> and uh, see it in oil that's the way the old fashioned mm -hmm. I see it mm -hmm. back in the day I switched to oils wonderful so carving yes is my mm -hmm. favorite part of the process mm -hmm. alright so why don't we talk about um, the templates and the resources you use for finding the templates? Um, I make my own templates mm -hmm. and I did explain a little bit. I have a table of all the different measurements mm -hmm. of different uh, waterfowl bodies and that's what goes into uh, let me see where is it That, that's what goes into the mm -hmm. the actual the width. My decoys, I call them fat ducks because they're a little fatter than real life. Mm -hmm. The reason why I do that is because they're a little bit more noticeable from 300 feet up in the air. And uh, they're more stable in the water, too. Mm -hmm. when it's a windy day and whatnot. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I, I have in here the width, mm -hmm. the length, side profile, the height. Mm -hmm. I keep all those things in mind when I'm drawing out my templates. And, uh, and as I explained before, I cut them out of, out of wood that I, I've cut on the bands, so I've built in 
slices of wood mm -hmm. and they last forever. I don't have to work. That's one step I don't have to ever worry about again. Mm -hmm. so that particular species of duck. Does well, that answer your question? Yes. And, uh, uh Usually necessary, especially open water, mm -hmm. you need a keel. There's less rocking, along with your counterweight. Mm -hmm. uh, a keel is pretty much a necessary thing. Mm -hmm. um, I make them with keels upon request. Okay. Wonderful. Interesting. Okay. Um, so another question I had... Um, for you that I have is, um, can you discuss the sort of evolution of decoy carving over the years and how your, it's, it's what you do is an artistic, there's an artistic factor about it versus the decoys that, um, you know, you can find today that don't have the craftsmanship that yours do. You know, you can find them in places like Bass Pro Shops. That's a different utilization than yours, which is an artistic, um, well done craft. Can you discuss that a little bit? Sure. Mm -hmm. um, I have two different um, categories of decoys in mm -hmm. it. Sometimes I go overboard and I just get right into that painting. I get the big detail, mm -hmm. which is not necessary. Um, you should, should think that a working decoy just has to be basic. Basic markings. There's nothing fancy about this. This is a scalp. Um, and it's a limited amount of, of, of uh, detail work in it. Uh, where can I go with that? Um, the evolution of it as a, okay. an artistic. Okay. Yeah. It started out, believe it or not, with the indigenous people mm -hmm. of this country. Mm -hmm. And they used uh, uh, rush, rushes, mm -hmm. and uh, they wrapped it up. The stuff they get like the along the shore in the marsh and everything, they wrapped up and they got this basic form of a decoy body, a duck body, and the neck and the head was separate. And they used whatever color, pigment they could find. Uh, either it's from the ground or from a berry, whatever they needed, they'd, they'd find that color mm. and they'd smear it on it. Mm -hmm. And that would flow very nicely. Mm -hmm. And uh, I've heard stories about they would have like a, a bunch of like a tuft of grasses around them and they just quietly walk to where the ducks are and they mm -hmm. come out from the arm um, underneath of the, the little island that they're hiding in. And they pull the duck under. Mm. Some say they would use a reed and breathe through it and come up under the duck and pull them down that way. Interesting. I, I don't know about the, the arrow and the spear thing mm -hmm. or the stick. I think mm -hmm. the, the water the waterway was the best way. Anyway, that's what they were doing when, when uh, people from Europe started showing up mm -hmm. and, and settling around here. Mm -hmm. And they they were hungry. Okay. And yeah. I watched the Indians have a real nice meal every night, you know, mm -hmm. the mm -hmm. ducks are around. So they took it a step further way back then. And uh, they carved rough images out of wood. And um, they made their decoys that way. And over the years, it evolved into a, a little bit better decoy. Mm -hmm. And uh, it, it's really important to, to make a decoy that's going to attract a duck, uh, and a, we call that confidence decoys. The preening, the sleeping, uh, the content, the foraging. These are all different postures, and most of these postures are done just with the head. Mm -hmm. You're not really doing much with the body at all. It's all in the head. And it tells the other ducks that these ducks are feeling comfortable yeah, enough the, to be doing these exactly. activities. Yep. like preening and sleeping yep. so it's a safe area for them to land exactly. okay yeah and also uh 
every once in a while you can throw a great blue heron. Okay, great. So does anyone have any questions for, for Paul? All right, we've got one in the chat. All right. So Paul, would you be able to tell us about the class that you're offering and when it starts, how much it costs, and the dates that it runs? Yes. Uh, my first class, I, I'm going to be doing two classes a week, Friday and Saturday. Mm -hmm. Each class is three hours long, mm -hmm. and it lasts, they last for 10 weeks. All right. It's, it's uh, quite a long process, but uh, that's what you need. And uh, the cost is three hundred dollars. All right. And you get your you will get your own. You will get your own pre-made, which I make up myself on my bandsaw. Mm -hmm. uh, I call them blanks. And uh, also, you'll get a a blank head. And then. We'll go. We'll start right in, and I, I have six people in each class, mm -hmm. so that's just enough so I'm able to to meet everyone's demands. Mm -hmm. You know, I work with them. I, I just go from person to person, and and just sort of coach them along. And mm -hmm. we have all kinds of chisels. I got uh, hundreds of them, <laughs> and uh, it, they're all displayed, and you can pick out what you like. Some people like to work in. With you know different tools, you know everyone's different. Mm -hmm. um, I have all that available as long as you return them at the when the the course is up. Because mm -hmm. there's another class coming right after you guys get done, and uh, I think that's it. It's, it's the cost mm -hmm. and, and the, uh, the the amount of time. Mm -hmm. And you encourage homework, correct? Oh, yeah, that's right. I do. I really do. In fact, I, I do mention before the class ends that day what's something I would like for you to do at home. Mm -hmm. um, that, that, that it's, it's, it's something that should be empowered into everybody, you know, independence and learning how to do it yourself. Mm -hmm. I'm self-taught, you know, just you have to get to stick with it and you'll like the results. You've got something that you can put on your mantle. Right. And practice makes perfect. That's right. And what do you find is the hardest things for students to learn and then the, 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 the easiest thing for them to? I think the hardest thing is the painting. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, and I help them with that. Mm -hmm. And I encourage them to take off and do their own design work. Some, some of the stuff is pretty crazy. I love it. <laughs> and, uh, you know, the, the, uh, the, uh, Resemblance is still there, and they would work. They're, they're still a working decoy. Mm -hmm. And and what was the other part of that? What do you think the easiest thing for the students to learn or for the students to connect with? Okay. The shaping. The shaping. Me. Yeah. Um, uh, a lot of people like to, like to use... The rasp, mm -hmm. which they find is a lot easier than having to use a knife or a chisel. Okay. And uh, the shaping comes up beautiful. Mm. I haven't had one reject yet. Mm. They've all worked out nice. Now we have a question from Kevin. He says, do you find more collectors or hunters that want decoys? Hunters... I have a lot to come to visit me in my studio. They just heard about me and they want to see it. And but they, they will never buy them mm. for hunting. Mm. But I do have hunters that buy them for their own personal decoration in their house. Mm -hmm. um, in fact, I'm working with a big group of men down in Texas right now, and they're all ordering, you know, different species and and uh, I keep telling him, just don't overwhelm me now, <laughs> one at a time. <laughs> and uh, they, they don't use them to hunt with. In fact, I've had them tell me, I would never shoot over that. I would ruin it. Mm -hmm. And uh, they use plastic now. Yeah. 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 Can you tell us about the books that you brought today? Okay. 
making decoys a century old way uh, by Grayson C. Chesser and Curtis J. Badger. It's step by step um, carving a decoy and painting. It's painting. Mm -hmm. um, they, 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 he explains how to use a bandsaw. You know, to set up to make decoys, if you get into it, it's going to be quite uh, a lot of money. You know, most that kind of equipment, drill mm -hmm. press, uh, six by 48 inch belt sander. Uh, I got a 10 inch high speed disc uh, sander, uh, 105 inch tall, I mean, uh, blade length mm -hmm. bandsaw. Mm -hmm. And I have a 70. It is a 70 and a half inch bandsaw. And then I have a third one, it's a 62 inch. That's for doing little tiny cutting jobs. Little tiny one. Uh, all those things have to be, have to acquire. You know, plus all your chisels, mm -hmm. your context for, for good, good wood. That's mm -hmm. a good thing I should mention that about good wood. Uh, when you order your wood from a sawyer, tell them that you do not want any heartwood. That's the center of the tree. Okay. Because with the center of the tree, I, I did this deliberately when I when I made up this sample for you. This is a, an example of heartwood. You see the bullseye right there? That's the center of the tree. See what happens when the wood dries out? Mm. It checks. Mm. So I can still use this. I can fix this. I, I do a little surgery. Mm. I stitch it with, with the dowels going back and forth mm. in blue all the way down. And I'll never, never separate anymore. All right. So any more questions for Paul today? All right, now I'm just going to share my screen real quick so you guys can figure out, so you guys can see some further research uh, resources about Harwich Historical Society and the Kroll Barn, um, where Paul is out of. So here's the socials and the websites for the um, Harwich Historical Society. Uh, there's their phone number, you've got their email information, and if you wanted to find them on Facebook, they're at facebook.com forward slash Harwich Historical Society. Um, just a quick thing about the woods. Um, he mentioned that he prefers white cedar, but the other woods used are white clear pine. Um, and this is the book that he was just speaking about with the making decoys, the century old way. There's the front cover. Um, if you'd like uh, just a sort of quick view on that. And I can forward this information to anybody via email as well after the, after the lecture today. Here's just a quick uh, picture of the um, uh, birds and, and waterfowl we, and shorebirds we were talking about today. Of course, we've got the adorable buffleheads there. Big fan. Uh, so this is the information on how to find um, and how to sign up for the decoy carving class. So that does start uh, the 31st of March, which is next weekend. Um, and this is the website to sign up. So it's harwichhistoricalsociety.org forward class decoy classes. We're full right now. Oh, they are full. So after the 10 weeks, you have another course coming up, yes, correct? Yes, summertime. Course. Summertime course. All right, so you guys can sign up for the summertime course. And if you want to watch YouTube videos, the ones that I mentioned right at the beginning of this, um, actually, oops, let me, let me go back one. Um, he has, uh, Harwich Historical Society filmed a wonderful series with Paul all about the artistry of bird carving. And it's a four video series, very in depth. You can find it on YouTube. You just have to open youtube.com and search for the artistry of bird carving. You can find those videos that have been produced by the Harwich Historical Society. Make sure you look uh, and make sure that it, it is the set of videos by Harwich Historical Society. Um, and those are the ones with Paul in them. Um, and uh, with that, uh, folks, we will see you again in a few weeks. Our next lecture is on uh, Sunday. Um, that's coming up. That is going to be, hold on, let me just pull up my screen real quick, really quick to get my calendar out. My internet is slow. I apologize. So the next uh, lecture that we're going to have in two weeks 
is all about uh it's always ready it's called mili it's called always ready military women on the cape and chatham's top secret coast guard station and that is going to be with our curator emily sullivan she will be um, leading that lecture so if you would like to sign up for that of course go onto our website that is sunday april 2nd of course at the usual time of 2 30 p.m all right everybody if there's no further questions Everybody have a lovely afternoon. Enjoy that sun while it is a little bit cold, but we will see you in a couple weeks. All right. Thanks, everybody. Bye-bye.